Good morning, um, everyone. Thank you for um, participating in. Thank you for participating in this webinar organized by ECDCM on the um, EU uh, AU uh, partnership and where the partnership is going. Um, I have the honor to host myself this morning, uh, Hirt Laporte, who is an exec, who is a senior executive at TCDPM, and Dudu Dia, who is the executive director of the Gore Institute in Dakar, Senegal. They are both in Dakar because they are um, off from a very interesting event I hear on the unconstitutional change of governments and what that means for the uh, also for the partnership. So I'm looking forward to hear also uh, some of the key ideas that were discussed at this event. But thank you for joining us this morning. Um, this event was um, planned on occasion of the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministers meeting that was due to happen next week. This is not happening anymore, uh, but uh, in the was in the official jargon, the meeting has been postponed. Uh, so, but we thought that uh, we would not miss the opportunity to discuss the partnership um, anyway. Um, I will do a bit of uh, housekeeping before we go into the topic of discussion. And so my name is Mariella Di Chomo and I work also at the CDPM and I will be moderating the event today. Katarina Farina, uh, our colleague, will moderate the, the chat. So if you have uh, questions or points that you uh, make, she will look uh, after you. Uh, you can either raise your hand or speak. Uh, please note, and I will open the floor um, at two times in this meeting, in the middle of the meeting and at the end. Um, the meeting is recorded, so please take note of that. And if you mute, your, mute yourself, then uh, that makes the atmosphere a bit more uh, easy to manage and pleasant for, for everyone. So, um, the partnership uh, between Europe and Africa has been uh, in place for many years, has gone through up and downs, but I think we could all agree that in this specific moment in time, it is in a bit of crisis and maybe it's one of the lowest moments of the partnership, if you look at it from an historical perspective. We also received the news today, very early in the morning, that uh, a few African countries count among the 35 countries which did not sign the Al Samoa Agreement, which was due to be uh, signed today, um, which is the follow up on the African Caribbean and Pacific States uh, and the European Union Agreement that was existing in the past. And um, in a way, this also raises questions around what is the space that African countries now have uh, and how do they see the EU um, in, uh, uh, among the different partnerships that they, they, they have? Where does this leave um, this, uh, the, um, they, their relationships and the partnership in particular? Um, of course, the cancellation of the ministerial meeting uh, probably speaks about different priorities between uh, European and African countries, or um, that also somehow can tell us a bit about where the partnership stands uh, today around the tensions and maybe the difference of views and the growing distance between the two, uh, the two continents. Um, so thank you everyone for joining, but these are uh, some of the points that I would like to maybe you hear and um, do, do to comment on this. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, please, the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you, Mariela, and uh, so thank you to ECPDM for organizing this webinar. And I think uh, uh, the meeting uh, has been Ministerial meeting has been postponed, and also uh, I think at uh, Samoa also more than 35 uh, states did not sign. Maybe Gert can come back on that because I do not have the right information about it. But what we can see is uh, between uh, uh, EU and uh, the African unions and the European unions, there is tension, and you have to say there is like that tension in the relations. And those tensions in the relations can be categorized on two dimensions. The first dimension is at uh, the political levels, and the second dimension is at economical levels, I think so. Because uh, one can see that there is polarizations, both at the EU or 
EU uh, level. And you can link it also to rivalries in the, at the global level also. And uh, because we have here uh, different and oldest actors. And one may understand also these uh, tensions is linked that we have a long traditions of cooperations uh, with uh, EU, African EU, because I think this is more than five uh, centuries, and you have new actors. So now what we have to do is to, to see here, there is a, a, the marginalization, both at economic, assist of the economical and political marginalizations of uh, Africa, uh, when we can see it. And I think uh, these marginalizations, which mean that there is a need to see where to prioritize the, the cooperations between EU and uh, African unions. I mean, I, some key principles of EU at economic level is, I can say, it, is free, uh, free, free trade, the second, the unfair competitions and respect of environments. If we take the case of free trade trades, I, I think, how can you encourage free trades in a uh, in a country in a continent Africa where economic economy economies are extremely very weak you see and I think uh, we can you can have to see it and because we have a lot of what we call shocks in Africa I mean in the 80s you have the debt crisis we have also the programs of uh, structural adjustments but those programs what that was the added value of that there is no added value because in the sense that uh, we have some kind of short-term priorities. And I think short-term priorities which continue, which mean consolidation of public finances, reductions of uh, uh, public expenditure, and also uh, liberalization of economy. And I think uh, if you link it to the role of uh, Europe in Africa, one can see that uh, this is not possible. This is not a long-term objective, and I think there is a need to define uh, new cooperation based in mutual interest. Mutual interest, which means that what are the expectation of EU? What are the expectation of uh, of uh, African Union or so both on both sides? And we have to see how to define the interests of EU and to respect also the interests of the. African Union also, right? and I think this is what in total. Because, as I said, uh, we have a polarization of opinions, both at, uh, in Europe and in Africa. Uh, citizens are more and more demanding. And I think uh, the, the, we have to see how we can support, also how we can learn about these polarizations from euro septism to euro uh, to africa africa septism also That's, uh, if i can uh, tell it like that uh, the second aspect is that i can come back again about that is that there are some kind of key political factors who are the drivers of conflict now and the key political factors this is why also we can have cooperation between uh, eu and uh, eu uh, which mean, for instance, I mean the institutional instability. Institutional instability, we have to tackle the structural elements. If you talk about a corruption, corruption is an amplified, it's an amplified factor. It's amplifying elements. It's an amplified element. What I mean here, there is a crisis of legitimacy of the institutions, the lack of regulation of political, political sphere. And also, I think we said yesterday, Europe have to avoid this double standard, which means that if you take the case of the coup, the coup, uh, you can see it, uh, the case of Chad and the case of Niger. The way we handle Chad and the way we handle Niger is quite different. Uh, when, uh, so I will maybe come back on that uh, later to give the floor to get. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dudu. Uh, I must say that uh, at first, when we heard that the ministerial was postponed, and we, when we then heard this night that 35 uh, ACP countries would not sign uh, the, the post Cotonou, the Samoa agreement, um, the first reaction that we had was, how is it ever possible that you put 
two of these important events uh, in the same week almost, mm -hmm. uh, making it impossible to have the same people traveling from one place to the other. Um, and it points to the overlapping agreements, and we always have said this, it does not make sense to keep up two agreements with essentially the same types of countries, uh, with the same types of political leaders. But uh, this is, of course, a detail. This is a detail, because there's much more underlying tensions, as Dudu said, in the overall relationship between Europe and Africa. And they go back to the COVID crisis already. Uh, Africa felt very much abandoned in the vaccine debate, uh, unilaterally on imposed travel bans to South Africa because of Omicron, uh, the double standards that you mentioned, particularly with France. I was very much surprised in the past two days, not really surprised, but it was coming up all the time uh, that France really has a big problem and that the European Union is in most African countries seem to be uh, an extension of France. So the European Union has really an interest to show a different face and to make sure that there is other voices in the European Union dealing with Africa that are hurt, not necessarily those countries that had, have had a colonial past. Mm -hmm. um, and this was said many times. Don't appoint, for example, a French ambassador for the European Union in a Francophone a uh, country that was uh, previously a colony of France. Take someone from Estonia, take someone from Croatia. It will give a very different uh, uh, image to the partnership than the one that we are uh, going through at this very moment. But briefly, uh, to make it short, I think we are in polarization and, and global uh, power relations that are shifting. Africa has more choices. Africa is becoming more assertive. Africa is really doing better its homework. It's sometimes a bit late, but what we see in Samoa is that the homework is being done. And what we definitely see is that there have been some recent triggers. I mentioned COVID, that's two years ago, but the most recent trigger is definitely the way in which the European Union is perceived to be handling the crisis in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is something that comes up, and by the way, the previous Secretary General of the ACP, Patrick Gomes from Guyana, he called uh, ACP countries not to sign because of that reason. Uh, so Europe is perceived to be too much uh, favoring uh, Israel in this conflict, and this has really done a lot of damage. I think uh, uh, the European Commission, uh, when it was projecting the Israeli flag on the Berlaymont, this has done more damage than uh, 10 global gateways can ever uh, repair. And that is the perception issue. This is an issue that definitely plays, and, and we heard it in the past two days. Well, thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, maybe I, um, and I, I agree with many of the points uh, you, you raise, and especially that there is some degree, if you like, of symbolism in also how uh, how much thought goes into organizing specific events. And, um, you know, maybe it's quite common they are postponed. That also has happened in the past. But on the other hand, it also speaks to the degree of, um, you know, intense and uh, prioritization that is given to different relationships, maybe. I wanted to go back maybe to um, some of what you were saying here around how the EU is perceived in uh, in um, in the region, especially the region the region where you are, um, and the conflation sometimes with with France, but also a bit what you were saying, um, in terms of this um, this expectation somehow, if I understood you uh, correctly, uh, that the EU could be like an ally in terms of uh, building institutions and institutional stability in um, in Africa. And for me, this both very much speak about what is the expectations on what the European role uh, can really be. Um, uh, you know, there is a lot of discussions on what to make, for example, of the normative role in Europe in, in that region, um, and also um, how the EU is uh, viewed in, in different countries. Uh, in, in that region, if there is any difference, if, for example, there is a difference between the elites and the populations in there, the expectations also change. So I was wondering maybe if you do want to comment on this aspect in, in particular, and maybe then we can also go back to other points with you here. Or if... 
Tizzy, the floor is yours. Maybe I can I can come in eh? um, expectations and and because the line was broken and we are far away from each other at this moment. Uh, but I think elements that came back also in our meeting uh, related very much to the way the European Union could uh, avoid to be overly patronizing. And that's also a bit what has caused to some extent the fact that 35 countries refused to sign. There's a whole range of uh, um, elements that, that apparently must have irritated uh, certain ACP countries, mainly relating to LGBTQ, to sexual and reproductive health rights. There's nothing wrong with these agendas. I think that many people accept these agendas. But they don't like the conditionalities that are being attached to it. They don't like the way the European Union is pushing these agendas. Um, and this has created quite some, uh, some frustration. So I would say normative agendas are needed, but avoid to uh, impose these in a too uh, patronizing way. Um, a second element, um, I think we, and Dudu just said it, eh, we have to go beyond development. Uh, Europe always has been uh, having the illusion that if it provides development cooperation that Africa will be happy. But that time is over. Uh, it's true that certain clientelistic uh, relations will be kept up through development aid and development cooperation. The relationship, uh, the France-Afrique as we could call it, uh, that's definitely uh, oiled uh, through development cooperation. But the populations, they want something different. They want cooperation that also reaches out to them. And that's the reason why in the Sahel, there was such a big opposition against France and against uh, the European Union. They want to make sure that they are really becoming, becoming the, the, the real partners of the European Union rather than their sometimes poorly governed states. Uh, so this is quite uh, an important issue that needs to be uh, addressed uh, as well. And last uh, uh, element, um, I think that many African countries expect more from the European Union in supporting their global agendas, their interest agendas. And the multilateral system is changing, power relations are changing, and if we really talk about partnership, then the European Union should really be the partner, the ally of Africa in the multilateral system. And there we see that things are moving too slowly, and this is also leading to uh, a loss of confidence, particularly also in a number of Sahelian countries in the multilateral arena. And this has to do, of course, with those countries who are not necessarily uh, uh, at this moment realizing that the world is changing rapidly and that we need to adapt our global institutions uh, very rapidly. I, I think also, uh, so the basic is, I think, between the relations between uh, Africa and Europe, as Gert said, it is, this is uh, how to avoid paternalisms. Paternalism in the sense that uh, looking as uh, the hegemony of Europe vis-a-vis -vis Africa. And I think also at the EU level, and the African Union level, I think we need to see how in Africa to avoid the mentality of coercion, the mentality of dependencies. And this is important because we deeply think that Africa must be the protagonist of its own future. In that sense, uh, there is a need for African unions and African states to define their priorities, their own priorities, based on the priorities. And the priorities are, so how to invest, for instance, in human capital. And I think this is why also Europe and Africa can work together, you see how we can work on industrialization, so for instance. Because if we say that there is uh, one, more than one billion uh, populations in Africa, and those billions of populations, 70% of the population are young, but those young also need to see how to get enough skills, enough uh, competencies, or to work, but also to invest in uh, areas where you have a high value, uh, high values as uh, added sectors values. But I mean, industrialization is key in Africa because you have to link it also 
uh, to migrations issues because uh, the other aspect is the access to, to basic uh, social services because you can see during the COVID times or Ebola times, you know, and I think uh, the international community just look at Africa. There was some kind of uh, uh, we were we were we were Africa was abandoned. If I can say it like that, I think though, and I think more and more we have citizens who are more informed about their rights to know what do we need to see. Because if you say that there is this kind of emotions uh, of fear from Europe, when I say it like this emotion of fear. You can see it because there is a high interest. One has to, uh, to recognize that the interest of Europe is very, for vis a vis Africa, is very high. What does it mean? We need to see how to build a collaborative partnership. Collaborative partnership which means that to let African state first to see how to define their priorities how to define the strategy, the expectations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe. The second aspect is, uh, we talk about double standard linked to unconstitutional change of governance, for instance. You see what we see in Burkina Faso was condemned, in Niger was condemned, in uh, Mali it was condemned. But what about Gabon? What about Chad? You see, and I think, uh, this is a, a ways to build uh, popular frustrations also, and this is important for that. Uh, so uh, there is, if there is frustrations, which mean we have a continuous strategic resistance from citizens, the strategic resistance from citizens. It is in both cases, because also in Europe also you can see youngs who are the sentiment, much shared sentiment is the sentiment of fear fear about also the future, fear about immigrations. But I think we have to see how to build this kind of bridge and bridge based in cooperation or collaborations, I think, in so forth. And collaboration at economic levels, economic levels, which mean to the strong need to strategic protection, economic protection of uh, African economy. Economic are weak. As I said, you cannot encourage free Free, uh, free trade in an area where economic are, are weak. This is not possible because wherever you go, the economy need first of all strategic protection, which means the economy security policy of our state. Secondly, how to have a juridical arsenal where you can also see how to uh, an appropriate administration to control uh, foreign investment. Because if you talk about climate change in Africa, if you talk about uh, expectations of natural resources, who exploit the natural resources? Also? And I think, uh, how, let's, let, let's see how to change the paradigm. Let's see how also to see Europe not in a cooperation of a dominate, dominator to dominated country. If I, if I can say, say, say that. And, and I think there is way of collaboration between the two. And Europe has to be much more pragmatic. Because if you compare it, if you do the comparisons to others countries, this is that. M much more cover, uh, pragmatic. What, what does it mean? I give an example. How to invest in human capital. How to invest in civil society organizations. Because civil society organizations will play the role of check and balance. In a, in the check and balance in a, in a country. Because civil society, we have a two kind of uh, regimes. You see, we talk about democracy, but we have hybrid, hybrid democracy, and hybrid, either hybrid democracy or auto, autocratic regimes that we have. It, you see, but does it mean if you go uh, 50 or 100 kilometers beyond the capital, there is no state there, because state is as fragile. And there is a need now to invest in civil society in the sense that state in Africa do not protect their citizens, do not protect their citizens, and there is a need to protect their citizens. This is a path where European Union can play a role. 
If you see also the regulations of political regulations, when we talk about election, electoral assistance, for instance, we see what happens sometimes. In that. And I think there is a need to empower to so for electoral assistance in uh, in the, in Africa. You see, in terms of migration, for instance, migration you can link it. Uh, there is a fear that people from Africa go to to uh, Europe. You see. We can understand that fear, but if we say that there is mobility of workers between Africa and uh, uh, Europe, in the sense that they try also to gain in terms of uh, professionals and uh, technical skills, this is a way to also to to cooperate. All in all, I think both at European sides, you can find the sentiments of fear, emotion of fear. And both on African side, in the young, you can have this emotion of humiliations. And, and you, if you combine humiliation and fear, you can have tensions. And I think now the, the, the key words, uh, if you need help, the key word is rethinking our relation, the relations between Europe and Africa. And during these two days meeting, I think there is a finger a clear finger that say that uh, France is not European Union and European Union is not only France also in Africa because most of the coup, the coup from uh, 2000, 2020, 2023 happened in a Francophone's country. And this is uh, now we need this kind of deeper explanation between uh, deriving the position of France in Africa also. And I think there are some countries who belongs to all these countries who belongs to uh, to European unions, and I think also we do not have a colonial past with Africa. If you take those countries in, in uh, Scandinavia country, do they have a colonial past in Africa? But they invest, but investing in a spirit of collaborative partnership. I insist on collaborative partnership. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you um, very much. I think we are uh, already half through the, uh, the, the meeting uh, and I have many more questions that I would like to ask, uh, not uh, least, of course, on the yeah, Israel Hamas conflict, but maybe I keep it for later and I open the floor to see if our participants have any, any questions or any remark that they want to make. Being brief, please. Um, so, to recall, you can uh, use the chat or you can also raise your hand and we will give you the, the floor. And I hand over to Kata because I don't have the participants overview on my, um, on my screen or maybe, yeah, it's here. Sure. So, we do have a first uh, question saying uh, development aid is obviously not the answer to this crisis, but can at least localization of aid be part of the answer? So I'll, TV, I'll leave it to uh, to Rete Dudu. <laughs> yeah, well, I think aid can always be to some extent useful if you inject it uh, in those types of uh, processes and actors that are really uh, or that can really generate a, a trigger and that can really uh, use it well. Uh, but I think our systems are still very much geared towards state to state type of aid and cooperation. And this is not necessarily the best way of spending uh, what we call uh, European taxpayers' money. Uh, but having said that, I think there's a whole agenda beyond aid, and, and Dudu referred to it, that is, in my view, much more important. It has to do with uh, visa regulations, for example, uh, migration and mobility uh, issues, uh, labor mobility. Um, uh, making sure that, that, that there is more uh, exchanges happening between both continents, knowing that at this moment this is sometimes extremely difficult. And when the colleagues of Dudu needed to travel to Brussels, happily they had some uh, good civil servants in the embassies uh, of Belgium here to help them. But normally uh, it takes uh, months to have a, a, a visum to, to travel to Europe, while we as Europeans, we come to Senegal without visa. Uh, so that that type of uh, humiliation sometimes is uh, underestimated uh, by the European side. 
Um, but I don't want to, uh, to, to go more into the details. I think I, we also should not start a process where we start to only point to the European side on what is going wrong in the partnership. There's a lot to be said about the African side as well. And yesterday, uh, I heard a lot of auto criticism by African participants. So we can definitely also go back to that point as well in the discussion. Eh? Indeed. I think public uh, public ed uh, must be channels on the high where in sectors which produce high values, uh, added values. I mean, and uh, I think the sector of education, for instance, here in uh, in Africa. And the sector of education is quite weak. The sector where to make uh, the civic space much more open, like to protect the citizens. And I think this is important also. And uh, the sectors were at the, at the economy, you know, how to uh, build a strong, to support on building strong economy. Because, because what I see, what we see is that uh, uh, the ads are conditioned but more than that, uh, you can have even a shift in a shift everywhere. I just give in the sector of civil society, for instance. You have northern civil society. If you are French civil society, for instance, either you, you have to get the money, and this money from a, AU or that, or that and uh, so that you can have another civil society who is a sub grant is and to work it. You know, I think. This will, you work like having some kind of peanuts, you see, uh, you know. And I think uh, the other sectors that we need also to support, uh, uh, like human rights issues, I think uh, the basic is if you, if you violate the human rights, then tomorrow it will be the causes of the conflict, you see. And I think uh, the violation of human rights issues that need to be. And the second aspect, I think also that uh, we African, we need also to see to avoid what we call the hegemony of presidential hegemony, the presidential hegemony. And so because we need to have some kind of balance between the power, the judiciary, the executive power, this kind of balance. And now how to support more support to the, for the independence of the judiciary sector. And I think this is also uh, quite important. So. But the thing, the basic also at the African Union's level, African Union's level must define its strategy on its expectations vis-a-vis uh, -vis the EU. As we said yesterday, we do not have a clear strategy from the EU to vis-a-vis -vis for the expectation of EU vis-a-vis -vis the European, European Union. But all in all, I think uh, the aspect linked to human capital is key because you can see uh, the aspect linked to migrations. Migrations, when you see how it happens everywhere, there is a sentiment of humiliation wherever, wherever it is. And I think uh, looking at mutual interest, and uh, I we need to open the door both from both sides, from African side and from also uh, European side, you see. And I think uh, you can see that even sometimes some uh, key uh, opinion leader or some even diplomats, African diplomats, the way that uh, they, you have this kind of behavior from the other side, you know, uh, you, one can question about it. There is a lot of question about it. And uh, the key question is now how to avoid, as I said at the early beginning, the polarization of opinion. Opinions from uh, the side from Europe, opinions from uh, uh, from Africa, so the citizens. Wherever you have now, this kind of polarization could lead to tension, leading to tension. This tension will lead to maybe some crisis or so. And this crisis, we do not expect. If there is crisis, don't don't uh, fear that we'll have some kind of uh, conflicting issues. But the thing is, is all the aspect is how much Europe can invest in one country like Ukraine, and how much uh, Europe is ready to invest in uh, uh, to work on cooperation with uh, 
55 countries. In world, looking at the side issue also, one needs also, there is, need, there is a need of clarification of the strategy of EU in the Sahel. You have uh, the strategy of EU in the Sahel, and you have several strategies of each countries of EU in the Sahel, you see. And I think this is uh, not, I think, uh, uh, something that will uh, tend to uh, build stronger uh, uh, relation based on trust. And there is a need also of this kind of trust building because if there is always actors, actors like it could, could be Russia, actors could be China and so on. And they are coming and okay. And how can one can understand, for instance, that you have the European strategy and the Sahel and several a strategy, each country of Europe may have a strategy on the side or something, you see. And this is this is problematic. And the area where we talk about synergizing. What I can say also is we do have to avoid this kind of monochromatic or homogenization of uh, the approach, of ap homogenization of approach, monochromatic approach. What I mean here, one fits all you have because i think in africa there is some kind of heterogeneity and you have the diversity you have to manage the diversity of uh, each countries and i think this is where so we don't have to avoid that having one strategy for all and i think this doesn't work it doesn't work with each country sometimes they have this kind of specificities uh, there are several ethnic groups several realities at the cultural levels and so on. We need to take into account the social cultural. Because I think at the, in the global geopolitics, there is three drivers. The first is economy. The second is culture. And the third is uh, army, you see. And I think we need to put our finger on the social, uh, uh, social cultural aspect and both also in the economic aspect. At the political level, we know that there is a need of consolidation of democracy because most of the countries in Africa, this is hybrid democracy and either hybrid democracy. Hybrid democracy because you have an absence of state in the rural areas. And this is where also we need to protect the citizen, a protection of the citizen which may need also to strengthen the civil society organizations. Oh, that's a very good Thank point. Uh, maybe Mariella, we do have a couple more uh, people who would want to talk and also a couple of written questions. Maybe for timing reasons, I, for now, I would just give the floor to the first one. I'm doing it alphabetically to, uh, uh, we have Miss Elizabeth. Uh, maybe if you can unmute this yourself and I would ask you just to keep your question brief so that we can then move on to, uh, to the next section. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, do you want me to turn on the video as well? No, I can't turn on. Oh, yes, I can. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. Elizabeth Sinopoulos from the South African Institute of International Affairs. It's good to see uh, Gert also on, uh, on camera. It's been some time. Just very quickly, um, one question and, and one observation. Um, the question relates to the points that Judy has made around the importance of the EU supporting, uh, supporting electoral, providing electoral assistance, giving support to CSO, civil society organizations, and so on, which I think actually is very important because it is fundamentally about checks and uh, checks and balances. But then you have this, this tension between uh, in, in light of hybrid <laughs> political systems, you have this tension between um, having a, a constructive, I suppose, relationship with the state, which might have a problem, particularly if it's not, if it is hegemonic, uh, which may have a problem with support for society, civil society, which acts as checks and balances, and society. So how do you, how do you manage the diplomatic, the political relationship in that context. I think I think the idea is a very important one and I certainly support it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have fewer countries or more countries signing up to a Samoa agreement, for example, if if they're feeling that the EU is becoming very interventionist in an area which is their their domain. So that's a, that's a question. And then just an observation about global governance reform. And I think somebody also posted something in the chat. I think the while the European Union generally seems to sort of be very much 
in favor and does the rhetoric is there about support for, for global governance reform, I think in practical terms, that's often not there. And I think this is this is the issue, whether we're talking about global taxation regimes, whether we're talking about reform of international financial institutions uh, and how one deals with uh, special drawing rights and and tax um, and debt and so on. And the question here is there must be small. Well, the point here is, you know, some symbolic at the very at the very least easy wins that the EU could could undertake because that's part of the process of building up trust. In the absence of, of sort of moving really practically and, and concretely on, on, on some of these reforms that where the EU and its member states can play an important role, I think it's um, at some point, I think developing countries will say, well, you know, we're just going to do our own thing in terms of global governance institutions. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, maybe Gert, you can quickly come in on this before we move on to the to the next uh, section. And again, everyone else who has their raised hand will be given the opportunity uh, at the end. <laughs> so you you are muted. I just ask you to yep. uh, unmute yourselves again. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, could well, you make your point at the beginning? <laughs> right. uh, one of the one, one of the elements that I wanted to say, a uh, quick answer on the first question of Elizabeth. I think the European Union has been putting too much emphasis on the electoral processes. Uh, sometimes this uh, is the only investment that is being made, but of course you need to have the whole chain of other uh, activities, building counter failing powers, uh, strengthening the rule of law, these type of things that need to be given uh, even much more importance than the elections as such, eh? because we have seen and we know uh, from what Boudou said that sometimes once the elections have taken place that we are not necessarily supporting the outcome of it. Eh? We had this in the DRC, we had it in other countries as well. Um, on the second question, very valid points that uh, Elizabeth makes about how the European Union is refraining from assisting Africa on some of the major issues, global issues, taxation, uh, financial institutions, SDRs, and so on. But there I would say that there is a very important role also to be played by the African institutions themselves. As long as they accept to be dependent uh, for their own financing, for their own operations, on European money, they will, of course, never have this autonomy to play their role. And this was a, a point that was stressed many times yesterday by the African participants. We should have autonomous institutions that are not financed by a donor. Uh, and then you can play your role in the global system much more than the African Union is doing it now. There are some positive signs. African Union will be part of the G20, but more needs to be uh, done in the next uh, months and years. Uh, so, thank you. And I think, Elizabeth, I do agree with you, link it to the tax, where also I know that you work a lot uh, during uh, the Africa Stand by Force in the G20. And I think uh, there is two aspects that we need to work. When I talk about uh, how also to deepen, to deepen, they said, uh, deepening the decentralization, we do not talk about it. I think at the bottom levels, we need to deepen the support the process of decentralization, not the concern the concentration, but decentralization. And I think also uh, uh, coming back to the aspect of taxes and free trade. And I think the focus that we put in the on the tables is uh, short term priorities. What I mean here, short term priorities in terms of economy, the focus has always been how to consolidate a consolidation of public finances or a reduction of in uh, public uh, public spending or liberalization of economy and i think uh, this is not uh, globally this is not an uh, economic plan and i think if we have to tackle uh, the real economy that we need in terms of corporations and once again we need to tackle sectors who produce high 
high value added because those aspects linked to consolidation of public funds what is the consequence the consequences is and and you, we enrich uh, uh the enrichment of uh, ruling classes you know we have enrichment of ruling classes which contributes to restructuring also of, of social systems you know and then in a in a negative way what that, that's why i in continue to invest to continue to uh, to insist on the fact that we uh, how to let african state defining their priorities you know and once these priorities are defined and so uh, within the priorities of uh, european union how to now to see this kind of collaboration based on mutual interest but the thing is uh, we have the the feeling that once you have there is this kind of power imbalance this is the reality this is this power imbalance but this power imbalance can be managed in another way it can be managed in the sense that also uh based on the priority of african union those priorities of uh, for europe has also to respect the priorities of african needs and i think so if you talk about uh, the commissions of, of uh, uh african commissions on the political affairs and uh, peace and security. At least more than 90% of the, the, the funding come from you know, Europe. And this is problematic. I think also African state has, if they, they have to know what they, they, they want in the sense that they have to, uh, 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 an organization like African unions must be funded 100% by African state or so. And I think this is where also African states need also uh, to, to work hard and to contribute to the development of their institution first. Uh, apart could, from that, I could, Sorry, Mr. Dudu, I think just for, for timing reasons, we could just move on to, uh, to the second part of the, um, of the session with, uh, with Mariella. Yeah. That is okay. Yeah, no, I wanted him to to finish the remarks, but we can uh, we can move on also due to due to time. Um, I think maybe I um, think we have elaborated a bit on you know, what the African side has to do. I think Dudu has made very good remarks in terms of um, an art better articulation of the strategies vis a vis um, Europe, and I take the point on the. Um, yeah, the unbalance that still exists and the need for somehow African countries themselves to own their own institutions and their own agendas. I think this is a fundamental point um, and a very important point to, to make. Uh, but maybe one question that I had is uh, more for uh, for both of you and maybe starting with here is we have heard from the State of the Union, uh, from the President of the European Commission, von der Leyen, this uh, announcement of a new strategic approach um, to Africa. I've heard very different things on the opportunity to do it in general, the opportunity to do it before a change of leadership that will happen next um, next year. Um, so I wanted to hear your thoughts about it. But in a way, if you were to um, you know, advise the Commission on this strategy, both in terms of its content, um, but also in terms of the process, what would you say? And when I mean the process is one of the um, more consistent critiques to the EU has been that and the demand, if you like, uh, from the African countries has been more consultation. Please ask us what we want. Um, and this may be an opportunity also that speaks to this idea of building trust. But maybe here we start from you, I wanted to have your commentary so we can also discuss a bit what the EU has to make, uh, which steps the EU can take to yeah, rebuild uh, or restore this trust in the relationship with our different African countries and the continent as a whole. Thank you. I would say that uh, if there is a problem in the relationship, Europe always uh, finds uh, or is of the opinion that a new strategy should be developed. And I think we are having too many strategies. If you look at the whole chain of strategies that we have, I'm not going to repeat them all, but there's so many strategic frameworks. That's not the issue. We don't need a new strategy. We need a change of practice. And I think this seminar has clearly indicated 
indicated what type of practices can change, uh, less patronizing, more dialogue, more equal uh, partnership, uh, making concessions on issues that really matter to Africa, these type of things. Um, and maybe also very important this, and that's the reason why I'm so much opposed to new strategies. I think strategies create illusions, uh, sometimes very costly illusions. And we've had this with ACP EU. Uh, we are keeping up that illusion already for decades. We believe that ACP is of strategic importance to Europe. That's, of course, absolutely untrue. If you look at the facts, ACP does not matter at all. And so this is the reason why I was very happy when I woke up this morning that 35 states refused to sign, maybe not for the reasons that they will indicate, because there I think they are probably making an error, but the fact that they are finally looking into what is of strategic importance to them and what is not of strategic importance, that is really a good sign. This is a very positive mood uh, and a, a very positive change. Having said that, if there is one strategy that could still be useful, that's the one that Dudu mentioned. Uh, it's good that Europe should also know what Africa expects from Europe and what the African Union would like to uh, see happening in the future partnership with the European Union. That would be a useful strategy, but Europe does not need to make new strategies vis-a-vis -vis Africa. Very, uh, very good. Um, and maybe to the, for you, my, I guess my last question, because then we, if you have 10 minutes more, we can open the floor to um, our participants again. Um, is more uh, the point also partially raised by uh, Elizabeth on the multilateral space. So, and your point on yeah, having, a, if you like, an African has strategy towards Europe. So, in, do you think that the, the the expansion of the G20, now G21, to the African Union will change a bit the stance of the African Union towards African countries? Will they see the African Union as more of an actor through which articulate and then, you know, present their demands um, internationally or, you know, or, or not? Um, how do you see that that will, uh, if that will change anything in how the EU um, is perceived, considering that also its mandate in representing African states will not change uh, as a result of the membership? I think you broke, uh, Mariella, we didn't get the full question, but okay. I understand you were asking whether the uh, membership of the African Union to the G20 will make a difference. Yeah. 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 Maybe do do as African, you can answer that question. I, th I think it is it is always important to be a part of the global arena. Uh, I say G20 or at the Security Council. I think uh, this is a way also to be part of the debate. But I think the first, the difference, the key difference will uh, rely on the quality of the corporations quality of the corporation based on humility humility both from uh, european side and from uh, african side also and i think uh, uh, because the things the, the basic is and once again which are our priorities as africans you know it, uh, who are our priorities as african i think there is a high interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis both from Africa to Europe and from Europe to, to, to Africa. And being to the G20, if it is managed very smartly, you can try also to see how to work, not being informed, but involved in the process of decision making. You know? And I think uh, that Africa won't, uh, will not ask I have lost them. I don't know if you. Yes, same from uh, from my end, unfortunately. Yeah, the connection wasn't very stable. Can wait a bit um, longer. Excuse me. Maybe we can wait a bit longer because if um, if not, uh, Perhaps we could already give the floor to yeah. Yeah. some of the people who want to ask some questions and maybe Bariella, you know, you do you do work in this area, so maybe you I can, can maybe in the meantime say as we wait that um ACDPM has just published uh, a paper uh, titled The Trouble in Paradise, 
the EU Africa partnership in a, in a geopolitical context. And um, this is authored by um, Lidette uh, uh, Tades and, uh, and myself. And uh, yeah, exactly looks at how the geopolitical changing, changing environment is affecting um, the partnership, both on the, so the paper looks at how um, it affects uh, Africa and the fact that African countries have more um, opportunities to establish partnerships with different actors, but also in different ways, uh, but also how it affects Europe uh, and the fact that Europe feels a bit trapped, if you like, between, uh, in a way, China and, and the US, um, and it's it searching for solutions to retain its own competitiveness and what that, and they especially at the economic level, but in a way also politically. Uh, and now this affects the partnership. So if you have some time, uh, and I think Kata can share the link, please have a look at this paper and send us feed, feedback and, and, and ideas uh, as well. Um, I don't do that, but maybe not. No. We can see them and we can hear you. Can you hear us? Again, uh, the, the communication broke down and eh? we didn't hear entirely what was being said. Uh, yeah, you, you broke out. Um, so I think maybe yeah. um, my proposal also because of time. I hear them, but I, I don't hear. Uh, yeah. Um, if you agree, because of time, um, maybe Kata, we can take um, a few questions, um, and then if you have ten more minutes, Dudu and Hirt, um, and then Dudu, you can make me some make some of the points that we missed um, in um, in relation to these questions as well, because we are already at eleven, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry the connection broke out. It's very unfortunate, but sometimes it happens. So, Kata, maybe the floor is yours if you can open. Um, oh, I think we can just sort of do a mix of the people that want to uh, to speak and some of the people that. Uh, pasted our questions to the chat. Maybe again, uh, alphabetically, we have Matea. Apologies if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name. Please unmute yourself and uh, and ask your question. No, it was perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, just very briefly, because Dudu in in, in um, specifically mentioned investment in uh, human capital, and I am from the Commission Services of international partnerships working specifically on investment. Now, uh, the Commission has outlined a few uh, avenues on how to, to do investment in Africa. And specifically in the last uh, period, the Critical Rule Materials Act. So I was just very interested to hear the opinion of the two experts on what they make out of, uh, out of that new um, avenue of support. Thank you. Maybe there's a, another another one, yeah. question uh, that, that was sort of that was in the in the chat that maybe is a bit related to this sort of how to motivate more manufacturing investors in win win industrial partnerships EU AU. So maybe if we can sort of liaise uh, these two uh, topics in uh, in your answers. Okay, I think. Uh, when, I, when one avenue is uh, related to human capital, I think uh, how also to make, we may create, see how to create this partnership around uh, workers' mobility, mobility uh, particularly in vocational and technical training, for instance. Uh, now you can see a country like uh, Germany, for instance. And I think how to encourage having the, uh, workers' mobility between those countries, European countries and uh, African countries, in like what we call uh, professional training or the technical, the technical trainings. And I think this is okay. And because the, what the, the work, as we say in French, the work of migration of youth also, how also to encourage this youth, you can kind of have this kind of technical uh, exchange of training and so on. And I think uh, the way that we manage migrations is not a good way for institutions. And I think uh, how to see, to open the, the door, where both and both sides we can try to exchange in terms of expertise. And one can see there is a crisis of education because we all say that this, there is an inadequation between uh, 
the learning and uh, the, the competencies need by uh, the enterprises. If it's, it could be uh, private sectors, industries, and so on. And I think this is path where you can also build human capital. So, and I think it, at both sides, how to encourage more uh, young from Europe or from Africa and both sides also to try to see in terms of uh, technical uh, technical training process. Because I think those this this is the real need. I mean, this is the real need. You cannot talk, go to industrializations without human capital. There is an existing human capital, but we have to, to do it. The other aspect is, for instance, for the primary sector. We tend to forget the primary sector, agriculture, for instance. And I think when you have uh, when uh, modern agriculture, you will need also human capital there. And in terms of also transformation in, in the secondary sector, and because more and more we have less and less uh, secondary sector and profit with the tertiary sector, we talk about this, uh, the startup and so on. But the, the things, the real thing is also how to invest both in the agricultural sector and both at, at uh, indus in the industrialization. Because you see, in this way, you, you have to create value and those values also can also be uh, seen by the population, namely the, 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 the youth, the citizen. Maybe in addition to this, uh, I think the human capital factor is very essential, but as we all know, the European Union is a soft power, so it, it sets norms and standards and regulations. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's not always um, the uh, due consideration of what all this means for countries that are having emerging industries, infant industries that are developing their manufacturing capacities. I'm thinking here precisely on, on the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. These are the types of measures that uh, should be looked at with a lot of uh, uh, more empathy uh, on, on how difficult it sometimes is for certain African countries to deal with these uh, norms and, and regulations. So transition measures are essential. I know that Europe is working on this, but it's really essential to uh, give a chance to these uh, infant industries, uh, manufacturing countries to really establish themselves and to create value added and jobs. We have uh, maybe two more questions in, in the chat and then we can we can move on then to the people who, who raise their hands. A first question from Faith Mabera, IGD in, in South Africa. She says there is a sense that a lot of historic issues and stock issues that are at the center of the EU-AU partnership are increasingly being viewed from a geopolitical prism. Based on this, there is a risk that disingenuity when it comes to realities of geopolitics could worsen mistrust. For instance, a lot of countries in the global south were angered by what they perceived as pressure from European countries and other members of the so-called collective West to take a position on the Russia-Ukraine war, which further fueled discontent with the paternalistic undercurrents. So ultimately, the challenge between us is how to move beyond the business as usual approach in conduct of EU-Africa relations. Doesn't this mean starting with a candid, frank conversation about what ails the relationship? And then we have uh, just another question here asking you to make a comparison between, for instance, the American approach to Africa and the European approaches to uh, and European approaches to Africa or of other uh, partners. And I'll let you answer, and then we'll we'll move on to uh, Guillaume and and Paul, who are um, who've raised their hands. If if we have uh, if we have the time for that. Can I start? Maybe on 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 the first uh, question. I think uh, it's absolutely uh, true what the, the person who put that question uh, uh, has said, and in fact, he's already given the answer on the question. I think we should move to a much more interest-driven partnership, uh, which means that we should uh, recognize that we have interest. There's nothing wrong with that. Europe should be very blunt about that and should also say, look, this is our interest. Africa, you also have interests. Let's sit together and let's negotiate. Um, and this has not happened so far. Many Europeans still say we are here to help you, but that's so absurd. 
uh, we bet seem to have lost them again uh, maybe Mariella would you like to uh, uh, come in uh, while we uh, wait for them to uh, hopefully come back <laughs> into the chat can you uh, can you maybe summarize the question for me again, Kata? Yes. So the question had to do with sort of with this um, this business as usual. Oh, it's a wrong word. It's, it's the North Slavic dependency relationship, and I there we get out of that. Kurt, I'm so sorry, but we uh, sort of lost you halfway through your your point. Could I ask you just to summarize what you uh, what you were yeah. saying very quickly? Well, I said what we should move much more into real interest driven type of partnerships where we are very clear about what drives our interest and what drives the interests of Africa mm -hmm. um, and, and go out or go beyond this traditional north south uh, logic that we have been adhering to far too long. And there the Americans, in my view, are more business like. Uh, they will put their interests on the table and they will sometimes act in a totally incoherent manner, but at least you know what you get. And there the European Union is sometimes a bit overly hypocritical. It's a bit uh, uh, too much this do, do good mentality, uh, which is of course totally uh, old fashioned. Uh, if you want to negotiate, you put your interests on the table, you have diverging interests and you negotiate until you find compromises. I think in comparison to American approach, there is similarities, you know, I think. And uh, maybe you can, yes, you can say it uh, at uh, American uh, much, are much more pragmatic in the, that sense, in terms of corporations, I think. You can see it also. And uh, the other aspect is that uh, <clears throat> at the Euro, Euro, EU has a key role to play also, I think. Uh, because all aspects link it to a democracy, for instance, I think uh, uh, there is some good things done, you know, I, uh, there's good things done, you know, an aspect linked to democracy, let's say, linked to strengthening uh, the institutions. But the key aspect is uh, there is uh, the sentiments of policy of assimilation, assimilation, which mean that you will do like I want, you will do, you will think like I want, you will drive it like I want. And I think this is why also there is uh, uh, the, 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 the gap between, as you said, with uh, the US approach and that of uh, uh, European approach. This is, uh, and I think also you can see it in the compositions of the country. America is a multicultural uh, country, and multiculturalism also go beyond uh, the United States. Also, this multicultural aspect is you can see also this kind of multicultural policy. In knowing that terms, that this is the policy of assimilations, and I think this is why also there is the need to change in terms of mindset, because uh, a policy of, uh, of uh, assimilation would like is based on the mentality that you have to be able to, to oppose the mentality of coercion, the mentality of dependency. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dudu. Thank you, Hirt. Thank you, Kata. I think we have to uh, we have to close um, the meeting today. Um, so I wanted to thank you, everyone. I have a lot of takeaways that range from I really liked your um, you know shorthand uh, maybe soundbite Dudu around policy assimilation and how do you as to kind of get away get um, distance itself from this way of thinking and having a more uh, pragmatic in a way approach, but also, um, you know, sensitive approach to what African countries want in the space of and independence they, um, they, they deserve. Um, and also, I mean, many other takeaways, a lot of emphasis on trade and the economics, 
uh, and also on the linkages between the internal EU policies and the external, especially the carbon booster adjustment mechanism, but also maybe the opportunity around the Critical Raw Material Act, which has been um, passed the legislation, I think, this week already, uh, and many other points. I am really sorry, um, not everyone could, could speak, I hope, uh, and I am sure, actually, there will be more opportunities to talk uh, further around these matters and many, many, many more. So thank you, everyone, for joining and have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 B